Welcome. Welcome to the show as I have my first cup of tea of the day. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. How's Montana? Montana is very changeable. Two days ago, it was 100 degrees. Yes. Today, I turned on my furnace. And I'm about to order firewood. Wow. And I covered the tomatoes. Uh-huh. Yeah, the tomatoes... <laughs> Tomatoes may be toast pretty soon, huh? It's, yeah. So what is this? I don't even know today. September 8th when we're just doing this, right? Something like that. So, so no, it's September 9th. I know exactly what it is. I should know that. Um, so it's already fall then. Yes, it is overnight. Wow. From a hundred degrees to potentially freezing your tomatoes out. Yes. And is that, I mean, you're a native, to, you're a native, right? From Montana. Yes, I am. Yeah, so this is nothing new to you, right? It's always a surprise when it's so quick. You know, it's... If you don't like the weather here, wait for minutes. Uh-huh. And so when will the trees start? They must already start to change up in the in the high country? Well, I haven't noticed any yet. I was up in the high country last weekend, uh, but I didn't see any real change yet mm -hmm. and what were you doing were you plain air painting no i was with family for labor day weekend i was did a little hiking and just uh spending time with kids and grandkids and you know drinking what? a beer for two <laughs> or three maybe even if it's the moments <laughs> right depending what's going on when you're up in that place like that and you're, you know, because you're surrounded by beauty and yes. somebody like yourself, who's always absorbing that kind of environment. I mean, you just can't help it. It's who you are, right? Are you very tempted to just get your pencil pad or something, just a watercolor, just something to do a little quick, even your photo, take some photos for later for reference? I usually try to focus on uh one thing at a time and if i'm with with family or friends i'm going to focus on having a good time with them if i'm up there to paint i don't want any other distractions around so it's uh and i don't just sketch i i sit down and do a plein air piece always Yes. So it's, it's one thing or another. I, if I try to do more than, if I try to incorporate painting with something else that's going on, my brain goes on tilt. And so I don't do that to myself. What do you mean when you say your brain goes on tilt? What does that mean? I get frustrated because I want to just focus on that piece of what I'm painting or what I'm looking at or, you know, concentrating on composition or all the things you concentrate on at the same time on a painting. And then if something else comes in like, uh, okay, you've got company now, or maybe you have to go do some books. Uh, I just try to get my, my whole uh, day cleared so I can focus and be uninterrupted when I'm painting. Have you always been that way? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Even since you were a kid, huh? <laughs> well, perhaps I will tell you a little story about painting on uh, Catalina Island in the early days with the Planner Painters of America. And I was totally engrossed in a painting on the dock. And Brian Stewart came up to say hello. I wasn't very nice to him. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Later, he said, you're not very friendly. And I said, no, not when I'm painting. I'm not. <laughs> you're all business. Yes. Yeah, I get it. I mean, I mean, you're a professional artist and you've been doing this for a very long time. Yes. And I'm sure. I mean, each painting, whether you want it or not, reflects on you, right? Yes, it's it's. Uh, I guess you have. Uh, I feel like I have to have everything firing at the same time, like physical ability, uh, 
emotional, intellectual, uh, whatever I've learned up to that point in the art world, it's all got to be firing at the same time. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but it's, it's just it's a total all in for me yeah. when I'm painting. Yeah. Do you, do you know when it's firing on, on all cylinders? Can you feel it? Can you see it in your work? I feel it more when it isn't. <laughs> you feel it more when what? When you don't? When it isn't. <laughs> yeah. No, I can, I can see it. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, I fight. I fight a little bit to get it there. Internally. Yes. <laughs> well, I don't think one of the things. That's... Yeah. It's called, it's called, you know, every art. Every artist knows what it feels like to be in the zone. And that's where you want to get. Yeah. How do you get to the zone? Is there a way? I mean, I, I can, I have an, a feeling, but I'm not an artist, so, or at least a painter, so. The first step is to eliminate all the distractions, if, if you can, and to focus totally on Let's say I'm outside painting on location, focus totally on that scene that I'm looking at and have everything ready right in front of me and just go for it. And I play a little game with myself and I say, particularly when I'm outdoors painting, if you walk up and put a stroke on that canvas, it better be right and don't go back and fiddle with it. I don't succeed in that uh, goal every time, but it's something I think about when I'm out there painting, yes. So you want every stroke to count? Yes, I do, I love brush strokes. I think there's a great deal of strength in a brush stroke. You know, it's interesting on that little painting and I want, and I want to use, I'm going to put it on the podcast. Uh, we'll put it up and show it. That painting, which is where I really first met you when I, we were in Montana, you were at the Russell show and the Invitational, and you were one of the artists there. You know, you can see that in that painting. You can see every single brush stroke has intention, and there's not, and there's no wasted brush stroke in that painting, in my opinion. Thank you. That was my goal, and yeah. I don't always. I don't always get there, but it's it's a focus that I have when I'm out there painting. Yeah, I even looked at it on the it's web the, today before I start, and I go, "Yep, it still hits me just like it did the first time I saw it." <laughs> Literally, uh, you know. it's wonderful when a when something that I create hits somebody. That's the reward. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you probably can see it when it happens too, right? When people feel that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, when I walked into my, went to your booth and I immediately zip into the back and go, what's this? Who's this? What's going on? Wow. Look at this. <laughs> of course I'm verbalizing the whole time. So maybe it's a little easier to know that it's hit with me. Cause I'm not, you know, I'm not much of a poker player when it comes to art. Well, it was interesting. Uh, it, was this your first trip to the Russell show? First trip. Yeah. Or have you been I'm not sure who you chose to do the podcast from the Russell show, but I wanted to ask you a question. Why did you choose me? Uh, because well, of that painting? Yeah, I think so. A lot of it has to do with that painting um, because I could just see that you had the skill set. You were a great painter. I go, wow, this is a great painter. I've heard your name before. I think I've even seen your work, but you were just an interesting person. And I knew there was a story there you know, that I have, that I want to get to, which I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to get to it basically right now. <laughs> I want to hear. Oh, okay. Yeah. Go yeah. for it. Yeah. And to answer your question, no, I haven't interviewed anybody from the Russell, but you at this point, there are some people that I probably will. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, you have to have a, there has to be, when I'm doing an interview, I'm looking for something thing that's going to fulfill me too right so it's not about okay. are you the, you know a well-known painter or you are you know it, it just hasn't doesn't have anything to do with that for me it's more of are you an interesting person that I want to sit down and talk to for an hour to two hours to learn more about 
that gives me joy and fulfills me and maybe helps me understand why I do what I do and, you know, why I look at certain things in a certain fashion. I mean, why does a painting that you did so resonate with me? I don't know, but it's not just the painting skill. It's the person behind the painter. Okay. Yeah, so that's why in a long format. <laughs> what an opportunity. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Oh, yeah. No, it's my pleasure, actually. I mean, it's a gift for me, right? No, it is, actually. It's a gift for me to get to hear these stories, right? You're sharing, you know, in some cases, intimate portions of who you are and why you are. So that's, you know, not everybody gets to do sit down and do that. And I get to. So, you know, it's fun. I, you know, I listen to these podcasters and they all we all kind of say the same thing. We all like it. We all enjoy doing it. That's why we do it. Because uh, if you don't enjoy doing it, uh, you're going to quit after number episode 10 and, uh, and, and it'll probably show on the way you interview. So let's talk about you. <laughs> what, I know you grew, I know you grew up in Montana. I do know that, but it was kind of, I mean, it's, I guess it's an oxymoron to say it was in a rural area because almost everything, but Billings really, or, you know, is a rural area, but it was a rural area, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, my ancestors and my father and grandfather and just way back, we're all farmers, ranchers. Um, I think I gave you a copy of the catalog of my retrospective from the Hockaday last year. Yes. And I started with my grandparents' place with a big rock barn that was built in the 18... 1890s and they took over that place in the 1930s just at the height of the depression mm. and as a result of that uh i'll skip ahead a little bit i was born on that place where the rock barn is and it's on the national historical register at mm. this point so i lived on that ranch for my first three or four years until my father bought a place a few miles north. And it, it was a diversified uh, acreage. We had cattle, we had alfalfa, we raised a huge garden, we had pigs and chickens and uh, pretty self-sufficient. It was just a way of life. Mm. Um, Electricity and water? Yes, we had hot and cold running water. Um, you never know. My, my dad didn't when he grew up. He had no electricity or running water. So, yes. Well, we at, when we first bought the place away from the big rock bar, no, we didn't have running water. It was an outdoor privy. Yeah. But then my dad built the house that I was raised in and built up his acreage to uh, at the, at the height of of his uh, building ability, and I was always out there building with him, he was able to top off 5,000 head of cattle and get them ready for market the last, you know, graining period of, you know, fattening them up. And in those days, they wanted them fat. Yeah. <laughs> now they yeah. want grass fed lean. Right. <laughs> but. <laughs> and so what is the city? Where is this that you grew up? Or town. I'm, well, the town that I was closest to was Sun River, where I went to grade school. And how big is that? Uh, oh, maybe 150. Yeah. And there were several little towns along that, that corridor on Highway 200 from Great Falls on to Lincoln and over on the other side of the divide. All of these small towns, if you pay attention, are about 20, 25 miles apart. Mm. Living in one of those, or outside of one of those right now called Augusta. And when those towns were first started, that was a day's ride. Yeah, I figured it must be a day's ride, yeah. <laughs> so there they are. So you must have had to, as a kid, even in grade school and stuff, you were on a bus for a good portion of the, the day to get to Absolutely. where you Absolutely. Right? Yes. 
Mm -hmm. And we had a long gravel road to walk down to get to the bus until the weather get, got really cold and my older sisters were let off the bus one time coming home and they had to walk down that road and almost didn't make it because it was too cold and blizzardy. Then my father approached the bus driver and the powers that be and we finally got the bus to come down to the house rather than walk that lane. How long was that lane? Like a quarter mile? At least, yeah. 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 I mean, people don't think about these things that somebody's on a bus. How long were you on the bus? Maybe an hour a day too? One way? Um, more than that when I started high school because it went from our place, did a circle around and stopped at Sun River grade school, stopped at Fort Shaw grade school, and then went to Sims high school where I eventually ended up in high school. Right. So you might be on there an hour and a half one yes. way. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, there were kids like that where I grew up because I grew up in an area that was ranching, farming, and they would, you know, by the time the bus would come, you know, they had been on the bus for 30, 40 minutes, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's interesting. They always kind of sat by themselves and were quiet. I don't know why, the ones that I knew. Um, but maybe you, when you live in isolation and that's part of your daily world, that you don't mind it. You know, you just go into your own world. Well, there's a lot of stories about riding on the bus, but I think maybe we better go past that. Um, I mean, the, right. the bus there's... driver, if the kids got on a fight, he'd stop the bus, kick them out in the borrow pit, let them duke it out. And when they got finished, we'd put them back on the bus and continue on. Sometimes our rides were a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah, that's a different, that's Montana bus right there. Yeah. Yes, know. it is. <laughs> so when you're, were you doing drawing or any sketching and things when you were in uh, grade school or middle school? We had no art classes uh, in any of my years in school, in grade school or high school, nothing like that. Um, my sister was kind of groomed to be the artist and she had all these art supplies that I kept getting into, but... I was outside more on the tractor and having 4-H calves and feeding cows and doing that sort of thing, which I loved, uh, rather than being in the house with all those girls. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you were you were doing getting into your sister's art supplies and doing something though, even when you were young. Yes, but not really much to talk about. Yeah. Even in high school, um, if something needed to be done for the the high school yearbook or something I might draw a little something but there was never a focus on it at that yeah. point but did others see that as oh she's kind of the class artist I think so yes yeah but then were... after I was after I was married I uh I don't know if you remember the old draw me ads that they used to have in the Saturday Evening Post or Collier's, yeah. one of those mm -hmm. magazines. Yeah. Little cartoon, draw me ads. Yes. Okay, I drew one of those after I was married, living on a ranch outside of Shoto. I did that and sent it in. And uh, to make a long story short, I bought this correspondence course. And I was, at that time, had two children. Mm. And it was through the mail, and it was called Famous Artist School of Fine Arts Painting. Mm -hmm. Everything was, I still have the textbooks. I'll never give those up. I got such a good basic education from drawing, composition, color, brush strokes. And during the 60s, and that's when this was, that was about the only place you get all the basics through this mm. art course and that was my only opportunity to get any kind of art um it was college accredited mm -hmm. i had three years to complete it uh i would get an assignment and paint it or draw it or follow through on the assignment send it to westport connecticut they would mail it back with these little balloons drawn out with suggestions on 
what I did wrong or what I did right, what more I could do. I have all of those assignments still. Mm -hmm. And uh, after three years, I asked for a two year extension could I have, because I had another child there. Uh, so this time, I, at this time I had three children and I did complete the course and have a diploma. Years later, I'm going to skip ahead with this famous art school of fine arts painting. Years later, I was at Helena at the Northwest Rendezvous show. Their guest artist was Ben Stahl, who I recognize as being affiliated with the famous artist school of fine arts painting in Westport, Connecticut. So I walked up to him, I said, Ben Stahl, would you please sign my catalog? I'm a graduate of famous artist school of fine arts painting. He grabbed my catalog, signed the name, and it said to my very favorite FAS graduate and handed it back to me. And as he did that, he said, very few people graduated. It was too hard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, yeah. Were, all, you were all doing it by mail too, right? Yes. Everything. And it took you how many? Three or four years? Five. Five years. Yeah. Yeah. Five I, years. Yeah, I bet yeah. many people didn't because you have to be self-driven, self-motivated to want to do that. Yes. You have to be focused on that task. Yes. Right? So I guess that translated into my focus as I'm out there painting. Yeah. I was actually out painting outdoors, and I have to admit, with a TV tray, before I ever heard of plein air painting. Mm. It was a natural. Yeah, it's around. I was born got a photograph. Yeah. So when you let's just back it up a little bit in high school, okay. when you graduated from high school, what did you think about going to college, or did you go to college, or were you? you no, know, by that by that time I was married. Yeah, I wondered if you got I had, young. I mean, that was very typical too. Married. Yeah, a lot yes, of kids. it was typical in those days and in that yeah. culture. Yeah, you know, you get married and you have children, and yeah. that's your life. Well, I wanted a little more. Yeah. Yes. And you married a rancher? No. Uh, he was a mechanic. Uh, worked. We worked on my dad's place for a short time, and. Uh, we eventually moved to Shoto where he was a mechanic at the local implement dealer. Mm -hmm. Yes. And did you share with him your love of art or that your interest in art at that time? Uh, he was not impressed with that at all. I... Yeah, I get it. <laughs> eventually, uh, in 71, I did divorce. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You were on divergent paths. Absolutely. Yeah, I get it. And so, but, but you, you stayed in reward. With, what's that? Was three wonderful children. Yeah. Well, that's the gift, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> so, but he didn't get what, what you saw or your commitment to this thing that you do every day, probably work on it to get this degree. No, no, yeah. not at all. Yeah. That had to be hard. Yes. And, and you're raising three children. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, listen, no, that see that's a that's a tough task right there to overcome. You have no art in your school. You're from a rural community. Art is not really probably judged as anything other than uh, something you do for fun, and you see it as something else. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, what did your folks think about you when you go? Okay, i have got this degree that I earned. It took me five years. I'm not going to stay with this guy and I'm moving on. That must have been an interesting conversation. Well, it was. Uh, uh, let's just say they were not impressed with some of my choices. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Um, so uh, when I divorced, uh, I continued with the art. I moved to Conrad, Montana. And I took some classes from the local art teacher. I also took classes from the local 
art teacher when I lived in Shoto, I went to work for a district judge as a legal, legal secretary. And so I was supporting children mm -hmm. and working, keeping my painting going for as much as I could. Um, so it was always there, but I knew that at some point, if I was going to be any good at this, I had to do it full time. Mm -hmm. And if I was going to do it full time, I had to make a living. There was no other source of income. Right. So I eventually, after 25 years, was able to make that leap into the unknown when the children were grown and into and out of high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, say, OK, it's my turn now. And there were several crazy jobs in, in the meantime. Mm -hmm. One of them was driving truck in the harvest for the wheat whackers who came up from Oklahoma, followed the, followed the harvest. Right. And you would drive the truck that the combine would put the wheat into. Right. right. And, then, and then if they got bored, they'd put me on the combine just for kicks. Mm -hmm. You probably had done a combine before, though, hadn't you? <laughs> well, I'd done a lot of machinery before then, yes. Yeah, I'm sure. You probably could break down a tractor engine if you had to. <laughs> well, I don't think I could go that far, but I just, uh, I loved working in the fields, yes. Yeah. And I still have my dad's 1949 Ford 8N tractor, fully restored. <laughs> Do you use it for anything? <laughs> But just to play around on, you know. Yeah, yeah go get some firewood. Got a loader on it. You know, I, I move a rock or a pile of dirt now and then. You need to put that on your website <laughs> and show that. Okay. On you. You really should. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's part All of your right. part of who you are. I mean, your culture is Montana, right? And it's yes. rural Montana. And it has been not only for your life, but your father's life. And it sounds like your grandfather's life as well. Yes. Yeah, that's an unusual story because you overcame some very significant obstacles to get to where you needed to be. And so when you're working, did you work as this legal secretary for a long period of time? I did for, uh, I worked for a district judge um, when I eventually moved over to the Flathead Valley to Whitefish, Montana. I worked for a county attorney there, and I worked for private attorneys. Um, one of the reasons I moved to the Flathead in that I moved there in 76 mm -hmm. was because there was an art community there. I wanted to become involved with mm. an art community. Um, you know, you can only drive a tractor so long and drive a truck so long and they want to go on to something else. Right. Um, so I took a workshop from Jeannie Hamilton, who was a well-known instructor in the, in the Flathead. I took one workshop from her and she came to me after that workshop and she said, okay, you're gonna teach the next one. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can do that. Mm -hmm. So I went home and I studied like crazy and I was still working full time, probably for the county attorney in Flathead County. Mm -hmm. And I taught the workshop and I went to Jeannie Hamilton afterwards and I said, do you know what you did to me? She said, I knew perfectly well what I did to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she mm -hmm. set me up to really get after. It. Yes. Yeah. One of my heroes. Yeah. She was igniting you. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's exactly right. And so that's 76, 1976. That's 76. Yeah. Yes. And how, and how old are your kids at that time? They're like middle school? They're high school and just out of high school. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so from that point on in 76, where you've moved to a new city, you're starting to get involved in the arts community. What happened from that point? 
Uh, a lot happened from that point. I don't know how much time we have, but at all the time I, in the world, I will focus on the art. <laughs> well, it's all part of the art. I mean, the history, your your you know the things that affect you and move you and cause you and directions are all they all affect your art as well. Well, I did become kind of an artist groupie there because there were several working artists that I totally admired and wanted to find out what they knew and how they got there. Mm. And every, every journey is different and you have to pick your own path and make it work. Mm. Um, so that's what I was doing. It took until working some really part-time jobs so that I would have time to paint. One job that I had was with a, a mortgage company and I worked there for oh, a couple months and I went to the boss and I said, you know, I know my job right now. And if you will allow me to do it in three days instead of five, I'll still go to work for you. So I can paint the rest of the week. And he agreed to that. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you needed the focus for the painting. <laughs> yes. And yes. So how long did you work with the mortgage job? Oh, I think probably a, over a year. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I worked for, I always tried, I was always working, but it was something that would just bring in a little bit of money so I could focus on the art. Yeah. And in, the mid 80s i'm skipping ahead a little bit uh because there were a few years that i went to i lived in denver joined the colorado artists association in the early earlier 80s mm -hmm. went to their convention and took first prize at their downtown middle of denver colorado artists association uh that was a big boost for me. That's I'm a not a city boost. girl, so I didn't last long. Yeah, <laughs> a, that's a yes. huge boost from 1976 to 81 that you won a major award. Yeah, it was early 80s. I can't tell you exactly what year, but it was the early 80s. That yes. must have really made you think, okay, there, this is a, a legitimate way for me to make a living at this point. I had to think that at an earlier point or I wouldn't have stuck with it. Yeah. I mean, I had to have that, that golden ring in front of me always. And that was the focus to be able to paint full time, make a living and get better at what I do. And, and so, so when you're working, yeah, when you're working in 76, when you start doing the, the shows, are you starting to sell art at that point too? No. Not yet. No. Mm -mm. Okay. No, I was uh, just trying to hone my craft and in 76, hang around with the artists in the Flathead Valley and, and just rub shoulders with them. And like I said, I was an artist groupie. Uh -huh. Do you think it helped yeah. you in developing into a professional artist by being around those other professional artists and watching what they're oh, doing? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Tom Saubert, Frank Hagel. Um, there were several others that I admired and still do. Um, and one of the things they always told me was, there are two things they told me. They said, um, forever be a student rings in my mind be professional in everything you do, not just your painting, but your marketing. Mm -hmm. And one of them even came to me at one point and said, don't take any more workshops. That was really good advice too. And so why is that? I think I understand why, but I would like to know why. Because I think you can you can be a forever student and take more workshops and never develop your own style, your own uh, personality in your paintings. 
Yeah, that's what I would assume that you become yeah. you 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 can become a very good intimidator or a, 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 you know a, imitating someone else. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. you don't want that. and I don't want that. Nobody wants that. No. Yeah. No. So that was good advice, and so uh, by that time I had taken some pretty pretty healthy workshops. Uh, one was from I went to the Scottsdale Artist School and ended up with Len Schmiel's workshop at the Scottsdale Artist School. This was in the 70s. I can't remember the exact year. Um, I borrowed the money to get there. I borrowed a car to drive there. I took his workshop. His focus on design is still in the back of my head all the time. Mm. Um, another workshop I took was from Sergei Bongart at, uh, in Idaho. He had a great deal of influence on me and one of his protégés, Adele Gish. Uh, also, at one point, I took a workshop from Ned Jacob. So I think some of those were some pretty heavy hitters to, yeah. to be influenced at an early early stage of my art career right i thank them for that yeah no they are and all good teachers too yes yeah and then and you know i haven't i haven't taken any classes from them or, or been with those but i can imagine that they expect a lot they do so you're working with these individuals that could be fairly task they could be taskmasters in the sense they expect a lot from you you know, people like Ned Jacobs and, um, you know, Lynn Shamil. And so when you come away from that, and that's, you know, in the 70s, you go to Denver, early in Denver, but you didn't like it because it was a big city and you're, you're a Montana girl. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be difficult. Yeah. Why did you go to Denver? Yeah. That's a, that's a big jump from Montana to Denver, Colorado. It had something to do with a man. Okay. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Enough said, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so after that passage, you go back to Montana. Yes. Yeah, you go. That's a love that segue <laughs> just right out of that. So you end up back going to Montana. And where do you go from Denver? Where do you go back to Montana? I assume. I went back to Montana to the Flathead. Yeah. Um, at at some point, I'm going to back up a little bit because there's been so much crammed into this life. Um, at one point, when I took the leap into the unknown to make uh, a living with this art, I bought a scamp trailer, one of those tiny fiberglass trailers that look like a porta potty mm -hmm. and I rented my house out because I couldn't afford the house payment if I was going to take this leap right and I lived in this scamp trailer for I don't know probably off and on for a couple of years and traveled around and and went to San Jose for a plein air show there and met Paul Bingham there from from the Maynard Dixon place at right. uh, Mount Carmel. It was a transition that was rugged to to do that. And at one point I had a friend who was who was writing her dissertation for her PhD and she didn't have any money either. So we joined forces and uh, house set for people in the Flathead Valley when they were on vacation. Mm. So, mm -hmm. so there were a lot of, you had to be creative in a lot of ways to to get to where you want to go. What's your, and it never ends. Yeah, you know, what did your kids think about that when you're saying, I'm renting my house out, I've got a little trailer, I'm going to go around and paint? Well, I... I'm I'm not sure. I just uh, I guess they knew me by that time and weren't much surprised at anything. Yeah, they knew you were focused in on doing what you wanted to do. Yes, what you were. Yes, 
And how did that, yes. how do you think that changed you or helped you or hurt you or whatever? I mean, I would assume you go through something like that. That's actually a really good thing would be my guess. Well, you learn how to be flexible and adaptable and whatever it takes, that's what you're going to do to get where you want to go. And uh, along the way, you have a lot of adventures. Yeah. So you have to look at it that way. And you're painting the whole time, I assume? Yes. Yeah. And were you absolutely and were you selling these paintings that you're producing yourself? Or did you have an art gallery? Or were you doing art shows? Or what were you doing? Well, I really wasn't in any galleries at that point. Um, I was trying to get there. The thing that really launched my career is another crazy job that I took selling yacht charters in the British Virgin Islands for Tortola yacht charters. They sent me all over the United States mm -hmm. to all the boat shows. So I was on the East Coast, Dallas, Detroit, LA. Mm -hmm. I was in Detroit and uh, at the boat show and there was a dark, there was a blackout and I'm looking out the window and people are robbing cars and you could see flashlights going all over in the place I was staying. The motel owner said, don't lock your door and don't come out until I tell you. Yeah. So I was looking forward the next gig at Tortola Yacht Charter job to Los Angeles looked pretty good at that point. And I'm sitting in Detroit locked in my room. So I had purchased a, a Southwest art magazine and there was an ad in it where they were having a plein air show on Catalina Island. Mm -hmm. I went to Los Angeles for the next boat show for TYC. And I had that magazine and I had an assistant and I said, Ray, I'm going to get on the ferry and I'm going to Catalina. You're taking over this show. <laughs> so I went to Catalina and in those days we carried slides of our work wherever we went. We didn't have iPads, iPhones, Photoshop, anything. Right. It was slides. I always had my slides with me. Yep. So I went to their show on Catalina, Denise Burns, we call her the mama of Papa's. She was running it at the time and she looked at my slides and she said, yes, you're in, you're a plein air painter. And that was 1986. Mm. And that really launched my career right there. Yeah. Right there. And Denise had her hands full because we were a ragtag bunch. <laughs> and, you know, she said, we were trading uh, paintings to stay in the Atwater Hotel. Mm. We were trading a painting to rent a golf cart. And I just happened to have my, my travel expenses paid to get to LA. It was just dumb luck. Yeah. And I was there at that time and went over there. Yeah. But you took the... He, so, you took your job, you risked your job by going over there, though, I would assume. Yes, I, yes, I did. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you were willing to take that risk of losing it all on what your income was as to become an artist. Well, it seemed like an opportunity to yeah. me. Yeah. How long did you stay with the boat company after that? Not long. Yeah, I bet not. <laughs> <laughs> not very long, uh, but it did... You know, it did get me into a lot of big cities and every city I was in, I went to a, to a museum or an art gallery and ate it up, you know, because I didn't have much of that here in Montana no. at all. Yeah. Though there are some, I'm just amazed the the quality of museums that are in Montana. I, I really am just, I mean, it's, there are some great museums there in small towns. I mean, Helena has got a great yes. historical museum. The Russell's a great museum. Bozeman has a beautiful museum. You know, Billings has the Yellowstone. Cody, Wyoming, not that far, has one of the greatest museums I've ever been to. Yes. 
Yeah, so at and, least and the, some... Hockaday, the Hockaday, the Hockaday Museum in Kalispell. Yeah, is a great little museum. Yeah, yes, and I'm sure I'm missing some. So they clearly value art in Montana. It's just, you know, art and history. I get that, but it is hard to yeah, clearly if you don't have an art department in your when you're growing up, that makes it hard. Right. Yeah. Yes. So from '86 on, when you get into the plain air group, then you yeah, and and plain air paintings, especially, I think at that time for the next. 15 years really do quite well too. I mean, there's a, there's this yes. plain air magazine comes onto the scene and all that kind of stuff. So do you kind of rode that wave? Yes, I did. Uh, I stop and look back and I think that the plain air painters of America, which we eventually called ourselves, ourselves, we spent over 20 years every year going to Catalina Island yeah. and having a show in the casino building there, which was elegant. Uh, we really created a monster across the rest of the United States. Mm -hmm. A lot of people jumping on the bandwagon. Yeah. Yeah. I remember it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, Maynard Dixon was a plain air painter from before then. So, you know, I always appreciate, right. you know, I loved his plein air stuff. So it was a natural fit to go, oh my gosh, look at these other people. You know, <laughs> they're all good. They're all good. And, you know, and you look at these artists that you don't even think of being plein air painters like Josh Elliott, you know, or John Moyers or Terry Kelly Moyers or Logan Hajaj, any of these, but they're all really great plein air painters. Well, at some point, I think we all, I'll, I'll speak for myself instead of trying to cover all the bases at some point i got to the point where i needed to paint bigger paintings yeah to get in to get into a museum show and a and a better gallery you know they want a nice big painting they don't want all small yeah. planar pieces which are still my favorites but so you'd graduate into using those plein air pieces and all of those years of painting on location and bring it into the studio. And boy, if, if that isn't a, a challenge. Yeah. Is that I'm trying to keep that freshness and that aliveness that you get in a plein air piece into a big piece in the studio. And it's, it's quite a, a, quite a hurdle. Yeah. Yeah. But clearly you've done a good job at that because I saw your big paintings and they're very successful as well. Thank you. So let They're just not quite as much fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's a different <laughs> ability too, I'm sure. I mean, one, you're outdoors feeling nature and surrounded yeah. by the environment and you know it's done in two hours or two and a half hours, whatever, however fast you are. And you come into the studio and you have a daunting challenge. You have to finish a big painting whatever it takes. Uh, yes. I could see that being difficult to do, uh, especially if your heart is doing the things outside. And there again, even when I'm in the studio painting, it's a total focus. It's like it's one painting at a time mm. and nothing else happens until that painting is finished. Mm. Um, yeah. It's interesting, yeah. Because a lot of artists don't do that. They work on multiple paintings at a time. Some do, like do what you do, but it's interesting. For you, it's one at a time. Yes. What happens if you focus if you hit a, a impasse? Because I mean sometimes paintings just don't work out. I do I scrape them off. I still do scrapers. Yeah. You know, I'll scrape them off and say, you know, this isn't going anywhere, no matter how hard you're gonna work on it. Yeah. It's not gonna happen. And it's going to look like you worked hard on it. And I don't ever want them to look like I worked hard. I want them to look like it was a good time. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, you have to enjoy that process or you're, or you're not going to continue. Yeah. But part of the process is realizing this is a Frisbee. It's never going to work. So just get over it and go on. Yeah. Get a new canvas. Uh -huh. Scrape this one off and use it. Yeah. Move out of Denver and go back. You know, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Had enough fun here. Let's go home. Yeah. So how? What's it? You know, I I I do interviews with 
uh, women artists. And I always am interested to see the roadmap and the difficulties that you, you know, that men artists, I think, don't have to go go against so often. Some do it clearly, but there is that extra, you know, being a woman in a in what is in Western art, especially, is seems to be more predominantly men artists out there. I could be incorrect. And it's probably just because they don't get enough exposure. But is, do you did you find that there was a problem, you know, being, you know, a sexist issue in your field? Of course, there's a problem. But the way I looked at it was. I don't think art has a gender. Yeah, I agree. And it was just another thing that you thought okay that's that that's where it is don't let it define you just do the best you can with who you are and what you are and and don't go down that rabbit hole of oh poor me yeah. no uh -uh. <laughs> no um <laughs> don't ever go there i know sometimes you have to t take a little initiative and be a little aggressive i know at one point i was uh on Bob White's Alaskan cruise painting with other artists. I was the only woman artist. Mm. And whenever we wanted to take a little Zodiac raft and go to shore and paint, the guys would get in the raft and go over there and paint. And I was on my own. Mm. Well, I decided I'm not going to let that go on. So I would get in the raft and I'd go set up right next to him and paint right next to him. Yeah. And they finally thought, well, I guess you can paint. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. sometimes you just have to meet them at, on their own turf. Yeah. But it's that I have to prove myself to you guys. Why should I? Yeah. Yeah. You know? And some of them, some of them were great. Uh, they knew what would turn my crank. And I'm going to I'm going to tell a little story about Bill Reese. He's gone now but one of my heroes at the time. And there were several paint outs, usually with the Northwest Rendezvous where everybody's out painting. And he would come up behind me and very quietly say, oh my, you paint just like a man. <laughs> and <laughs> I would say, is that supposed to be a compliment or what, you know? Right. <laughs> All right. You just rise above it. You just rise above it. No, I've heard a lot of women. It's have there. That. It's there. Yeah, I've heard a lot of women painters who've had that same exact thing asked them. Wow, you paint just yeah. like a man. <laughs> and you should say, wow, congratulations, you paint just like a woman. <laughs> <laughs> no, Bill did it because he knew that would get my goal. Yeah, he, he, was, did it he was just surprising you yeah but sometimes that's real oh, yeah. that they say that kind of stuff it comes out and you know from the gut you know and it's too bad and i think it's i think we're making inroads but we're not there yet no it's not us it's the culture it is the culture yeah 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 it's just the culture yeah. no i agree yeah so you've been doing this now for as a professional artist, like would you say from 1986? Is that when you, I mean, you you are yes. Yeah, is that kind of your cut where you go? This is where I'm an artist. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's almost 40 years, um, and then you've been working at your craft longer than that. What's what's going on now? Where are you headed now? I know you did the Russell show that I. That's where I met you at. I've seen your your things otherwise, but what do you have coming up or what gallery shows that you might have or your own shows that you're doing? Okay. I just shipped a piece to the Booth Museum in Cartersville, Georgia yep. for a group show with the Planner Paints of America. Mm -hmm. I've been involved in a local show here in uh, Shoto, Montana, which is about 25 miles from where I live. And it's an annual show that's been going on for over 20, 30. And it supports the local uh, hospital that's in Shoto, mm. the Teton Medical Center. So the, the profits go towards supporting that 
that healthcare facility that we have there. And it has turned out to be a really uh, good show on all the, I've been at it for a long time because I live here, but a lot of the other artists are recognizing what a straightforward, wonderful show it is and what good support they have. There's no buyer's fee. It's a straight out, honest auction. Mm -hmm. And they sell 100% and they don't have any passes and everybody's happy. And it's just booming in the last few years. Yes. And I'm still um, involved with FOR, Fine Arts, Frame of Reference Fine Arts in, in Whitefish and Big Fork and Tucson also. Yes. Have you done the Mountain Oyster show at all? No, I haven't. You should apply for that. Okay. Probably too early, too too late for this year because it's in November, but maybe not. But um, okay. but yeah, you should. You you know you would be perfect. Okay. Yeah, you'd do well. I think you you should do it, and you're welcome to use my name as a reference. <laughs> that way, when you come down to do the okay, show, I, I will. I get to see you again. <laughs> I I love painting in the Southwest. I go there almost annually to do some southwest pieces and get out of the montana winter yeah um yeah there's a bunch of people that do that so, by the way that are do montana okay. arizona yeah they do it all the time okay mountain oyster club yep and they have an annual after session. after our our interview here maybe you could have patrick send me some information yeah. on how to apply for them yeah i'll do that i'm i plan to, i plan to go to cody later this month on the, around the 20th and check that out and see what that show is all about. I was I'm, just there. I went and saw it. it was, oh, did you? Yeah. Okay. Excellent, actually. Yeah, they had a lot of okay. painters, really good painters. Yeah, it was an excellent show. I, I don't know when they put it up and it's already, you can buy stuff, but I, the opening, I guess, might be on in, around that time, the 20th or so, is it? Well, they're, they're Rendezvous Royale, where they have the big auction. Yeah is the 22nd i believe right. so i'm gonna go attend that and see how that works yeah i bet it's great yeah i haven't been to it but yeah. the art was good i can just say that okay and, that's good to hear and so people can find you on your website and maybe you can give us that it's uh linda tippett's um let's see probably dot com i think it is actually yeah it is dot com yeah and do you have an instagram account I do. Yes. That's Linda Tippett's. Yeah. Okay. So they can find you on both those yes. areas. Well, anything else you want to say before we call it a day and I go out to the 95 degree weather and you keep your jacket on? I would say the traveling that I've done has really entered into my growth as an artist. I've painted in five different foreign countries on location. Mm. And when I had the retrospective at the Hockaday last year, I just happened to have two or three pieces from each of those countries, which helped fill out their requirement of 60 paintings for this show to fill their gallery, mm. their main floor gallery. Uh, so I guess what I'd like to say is, is thank you, Art World, for making my world so big mm. and making it such a wonderful adventure. And um, I just think about the the biker saying when when they when they come to the end, they say, "Wow, I'm full of road rash and bruised and cut, but what a ride! I love it." <laughs> Well, you have a beautiful soul. You're a lovely painter. I, I like your work a great deal. And that's why, you know, that's how I found you. The art pulled me in, but clearly the person was more magnetic, even more. So I, uh, wow. Thank you. Yeah. It was really wonderful getting to spend some time with you and I'll look forward to seeing you somewhere. I don't know, maybe back at the Russell next year. Who knows? I had a great time there. It was a wonderful, a wonderful place. They, they do an amazing show and, you know, just a, killer museum so will our paths will cross 
Okay. <laughs> Thanks for this opportunity. Yeah. I really appreciate oh, it. Absolutely. No, it was my pleasure. It really was. Linda Tippett's. Thank you so much. You're welcome.